tonight, uh, we're going to do a series here for this month, actually. Uh, we're going to take a look at, we're going to call it evidence. We're going to take a look at a, a handful of things, actually, that are really uh, becoming, they're coming to the surface in our culture. And so tonight, specifically, we're going to look at the evidence, actually, for Jesus. Okay, now, believe it or not, there's a movement right now that's really even trying to discredit, did Jesus even really exist? Okay, and uh, people are trying to portray him as a mythological character, much like Zeus. Now, obviously, in a room like this, for most of us, that's going to sound absurd. I know maybe perhaps uh, some of you are kicking the tires on Christianity, but for most of us, are like, really? Are you kidding? But yeah, if you just get outside the church bubble just a little bit, what you'll find is there's this new movement by the new atheists who are trying to say the guy never even existed. And that's what we're going to take a look at some things tonight is, one, do we have to check our brains at the door by being a follower of Jesus? Um, hey, I came across this, by the way, and I was wanting to share it with you. It's like, basically, um, with, with Jesus himself, could you, like, really pick out where he would really be, for example? Like, you know, would Jesus be like a Californian? You know, because he, he was always barefoot, right? Walking around, often on the beaches, right? Or some people say, well, maybe Jesus would be a woman because he was always trying to explain things to 12 men who never really seemed to get it, right? <laughs> so I've heard that one. Um, I've heard people say, well, you know, Jesus was Italian. He apparently always liked to talk with his hands, always seemed to have wine uh, with his meals, right? Uh, some people would say, well, you know, Jesus was Irish because... You know, he didn't seem to have a problem being around people who drank, and he never got married. So, I don't know. Anyways, there's lots of things out there. When I asked a question about what was your first image of Jesus and how does that really compare, uh, for me, the first one I ever saw was a, was a portrait of my grandmother's house, and by the day's standards, it would be considered cheesy, you know, because it had like a little Christmas light bulb, and you could flip a switch, and actually a light would shine onto the portrait. But I remember seeing, you know, Jesus there, and it was like a... You know, elbows and above shot, but he looked really serene. It's like, you know, there's something different about that guy. But uh, as I got into my teens, he, he often reminded me of a lot of guys I surfed with. You know, just had like a good tan, <laughs> beard, long hair. It's like, oh, yeah, I know that dude. You know, I've seen him before. So, but what we're going to do tonight is we want to take a look, first of all, at the historical Jesus. I want to share some things with you, really, that every follower of Jesus should know about Jesus. So let me just give you some little factoids, and it's not really to insult your intelligence. Jesus was indeed born in Bethlehem, okay, but he grows up in a place called Nazareth, okay, so sometimes there's even these historians who are trying to say, well, is it Bethlehem or Nazareth? No, well, he was born in Bethlehem in the same way that you were born in a certain place, but perhaps you grew up somewhere else, all right, and in fact, check this out, there's, you really shouldn't even know about Bethlehem or Nazareth, should you? There, there's, there's no reason to know about these towns. This is like saying, Possum Hollow and Clark Seat, West Virginia, all right? The only reason we know about these two towns really is because of Jesus. The only reason people go there today is because of Jesus, okay? Now, so Jesus grows up, and he's a carpenter until he's the age of 30. Now, I've always thought that was kind of interesting for a couple of reasons. One, could you imagine going over to see Jesus, like, hey, uh, yeah, Jesus, uh, you know, my cousin here is sick. You know, I was wondering if you could heal my cousin from influenza. And uh, by the way, I need to, could you really help me with this bookcase? You know, this bookcase just doesn't work out. Because you know, he was a carpenter and he was a healer. And, but until he was 30, so think about that. I would think, shouldn't Jesus be doing something more important? Right? Really? God is driving nails? God is pushing a saw? And so may we be encouraged that whatever God calls us to do, may we be good at it until he was, I would think, man, he shouldn't be like president of, I don't know, like a seminary or pastor in a mega church. Now even watch this. His, most of his messages were given to just 12 people. I mean, I don't know, shouldn't he have like a big, I don't, I don't know, 12 people. And at the very end of his ministry, from what we can tell, he only had 120 followers, really. It was Jesus. Right. So he begins his public ministry. It lasts for three years. And he's crucified in Jerusalem. We think he was born about the year 4 BC. 
And we think he died in about, he was crucified around the year 26 AD. Now, of course, there was no year zero, so about 33 and a half years from what we can tell. Those are just some basic facts about Jesus. Now, the question would be, can you prove that there really was a Jesus? Now, I can go to Thomas Jefferson's grave. I know where he's buried. We could exhume him. We could, we could get the, the, the bones, all right? Uh, I've been to Patrick Henry's gravesite before. Um, I've been to Mount Vernon before. I mean, there are some great leaders where we can go to their tombs, but what about you? Can you really prove outside the Bible, is there anything that really tells us that there really is a Jesus? Or is this, or, or are we just reading something like Grimm's fairy tales? How, how would we know? Is there anything outside of the Bible? And the answer is yes. And so I want to give you a few things tonight that I hope you'll write down, that I hope you'll remember that will help you next time you're at the water cooler, next time you're in the coffee room, you can say, actually, there is some evidence that supports, first of all, that there really was a historical figure known as Jesus. And likewise, it's going to be important for us to take a look at what did he actually have to say about himself? Some historical evidence. Let me give you just a handful real quick. How many of you have ever heard the name? If you've ever watched a show like History Channel or Discovery Channel on anything about religion or Jesus, you've probably heard the name Josephus. Have you ever heard that before? All right, what's the big deal about Josephus? Well, Josephus, the big deal is he was a Jewish historian, not a Christian historian. Okay, he lived during the first century, and he gives just a very matter-of-fact report, and I'm going to read it to you uh, briefly here. So this is just uh, like a history book, Josephus reporting. Uh, it's from a book called Antiquities of the Jews, uh, chapter 20, verse 9. Festus now was dead. This is the same Festus as described in the book of Acts. So what does that tell us for one? The book of Acts is reliable. It's not making up mythological people. Okay, because so first of all, Festus was dead. Now, Binus was now upon the road, so he assembled a Sanhedrin of judges. Sanhedrin. That's also in the Bible, so it's, it's matching up. And now watch this, though. And he brought before them the brother of Jesus. That's what Josephus says. Who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, and when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. All right, so the significance of this is the fact that we've got a non-Christian historian saying there was a guy named Jesus. All right, and in fact, he's referred to as the Christ. And what's taking place? Persecution, just as it's described in the book of Acts. I'll give you another one. I won't bore you. There's, there's others we could go to here. There's one guy, for, in fact, his name's Julius Africanus. He even records an unusual darkness that takes place when a man from Nazareth, who people said was the Christ, was crucified. And then he just goes on to his next sentence. It's just a very matter of fact. He says, there's this unusual darkness that came upon Jerusalem on the day when this man from Nazareth, some people said he was the Christ, was crucified. Tacitus, he is a Roman historian. You know, there had been a great fire that had been started by Nero, and so this is what Tacitus, a Roman historian, has to say. Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christ, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of its procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, then he continues. Do you see the significance of this? Tastus, a Roman historian, is just simply reporting what's happening here. He's saying, look, I'm telling you that this fire, it was blamed on the Christians, all right? And who was the leader of it? A guy known as Christ. He's a historian. He's not a, a journalist for National Enquirer, okay? So that's one group of people. A second group of people would be the church fathers. Have you ever heard this phrase before, church fathers? Okay, so eventually apostles die. Peter, James, John, they die. And the next group to come up, this next wave, was what we refer to in uh, church history as the church fathers. Okay, so they take on the mantle of being the leaders of the church. Let me just give you a few things here real quick. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but their writings have survived. Now watch this, guys. Stay with me. If there was a rapture of the New Testament, imagine every New Testament right now just disappeared. <laughs> rapture, like a Hal Lindsey movie from the 70s. Um, gone. We would have all but 85 verses of the New Testament from the church fathers because they were writing to each other. 
right? So this first guy, Clement of Rome, he writes a letter to the church at Corinth. They're having the same problems. Hey, let me encourage you, by the way, if you're in leadership or if you're leading a Bible study, look, the things that the apostle Paul started was still having issues. I mean, he's like, look, you guys need to stop fornicating, all right? Clement of Rome sending the same message to him, all right? Stop marrying people who aren't Christians. Same message, okay? He, he makes reference to Jesus. Another guy named Ignatius, he talks about the importance of, watch this, meeting on Sunday. Why is this important? When, when do Jews meet? Saturday. Meet on a Saturday. When do Christians meet? Saturday, Sunday. Saturday, Sunday, whenever. But historically, Christians meet on if you were asked any, if you go out to Fashion Square Mall, they're going to say Sunday, right? Someone moved the date. This would, imagine you go out of the country and you come back and someone says, oh, yeah, we changed the date for July 4th. It's uh, July 5th now, we have decided. <laughs> whoa, whoa, what? Yeah, we've moved the date. It's now July 5th from now on. This would be huge because all the first followers of Jesus were what? They were Jewish. Right? And so Ignatius is right and saying, no, this is why we meet on Sunday. And watch this. I'm glad you're sitting down. From what we can tell for about the first several decades, every Sunday service was a sunrise service. You know, just between us, I'm kind of glad that tradition changed. <laughs> why a sunrise service? Yep. Oh, well, because that's when the tomb was discovered empty. And we've been meeting sunrise service ever since. Oh, you see, it was in the early morning hours when it was discovered empty. Yeah, that was some thunder, like sound effects, like a stone being rolled away. All right? Yeah. So I'll give you one more. Um, um, Polycarp, he, he argues for Easter. Watch this. Stay with me. He's going to argue for Easter to be on the same date every year. Now, for me, I'm with Polycarp be easier for me to plan my life and my schedule. Oh, man, I can't believe I'm out of country on Easter Sunday, practically, all right? Um, but Polycarp was a disciple of John. And Polycarp was saying, no, see, I was discipled by John, and John said it happened on this date. John was there. So he said, no, no, we, we, we don't want to follow this Passover thing anymore. Let's do it on this date. It was on this date the tomb was discovered. And this is what John told me. Polycarp's a disciple of John. The church fathers are testimony that, one, there was a historical Jesus. They're writing letters about it. They're giving their lives for it. They're willing to die for these causes. I'll give you just a few more here. A fish symbol. Anyone have that on the back of your car? Okay, I don't because I'm not that great of a driver. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, look, I, I got places to go, people to see. Look, I got to go, man. I can't, I can't have a Christian fish symbol on the back of my car. Maybe one day, all right? Uh, actually, truth of the matter is I can never get a ticket again, all right, ever, all right? So, like, I'm, I'm imagining even in, like, the millennial reign of Christ, um, Jesus is going to have me go through, like, a driving school or something. So, anyways, this uh, symbol of the fish, ichthus, the reason people have that symbol is in Greek, uh, ichthus, it turns out to be an acronym, Okay, so it stands for Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. And so it's like a very convenient way to be an acronym. In fact, we're told that some of the first century Christians, they kind of had this like secret fraternity or sorority handshake. And if they'd be talking to you, they'd maybe make half of the symbol while they were talking to you. And if you completed the symbol, that meant, oh, you're a follower of Jesus as well. I mean, you got to keep in mind, Christians in the first century, they're lion food, Right? And so that very symbol as well. What's the point here? Some of the earliest symbols for Christianity, it wasn't a cross. That doesn't show up until the 300s. When the first symbols was the fish because of what it stood for. Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Here's the point. There's lots of information outside the Bible. There really was a person called Jesus Christ. His people believed that he had risen from the dead. And he himself had made some very unique and some very special claims that I want to share with you. So I want to talk, I want to kind of uh, demyth some of the urban legends 
that exists. Now, there's some really popular urban legends. I, I probably should have asked that instead as one of the questions, but uh, some of the ones that keep resurfacing, you know, over and over, I keep hearing that Mr. Rogers used to be an army sniper. Have you ever heard that before? <laughs> okay. Okay. He wasn't. Yeah, see, that's incorrect. See, that's even worse. All right, so uh, we've gone from an uh, Army Ranger to Navy SEAL, Mr. Rogers. Uh, no, he was neither. He, he, he did not serve in the armed forces. All right, what about if you ever heard this one? Uh, Walt Disney is being cryogenically preserved in uh, Disneyland under uh, the princess's castle. Have you ever heard that one before? Anyone? Okay. Uh, okay. Now, he, he was cremated. Okay, so uh, ur urban legend, all right? What about, uh, if you ever heard the one that uh, Carrot Top, did you hear that Carrot Top died? Yeah, he fell out of a roller coaster at Six Flags. Okay. No, he didn't, okay, he's fine, all right? What about, uh, if you ever heard that uh, Carrot Top used to be a woman? <laughs> Have you ever, ever heard that one? <sighs> well, uh, they'll explain why he's still single, perhaps, if so, but. No, he's fine. He's always been a guy. He's always been a dude. All right, so these are urban legends, things that aren't quite true. So I want to walk us through some of these urban legends, and I want to kind of show you really uh, just a handful of things about what the Bible. So let, let's take a look. First of all, just some really simple things, really, that every single Christian should know about Jesus. The Old and the New Testaments affirm that a Messiah was a part of history. Okay, do we have any legal experts in the room? Or semi, okay. What's a testament considered? A testament is considered a legal binding document that expresses someone's will. Like normally, one of the few times we use it now outside the Bible, we'll say, well, this is their last will and testament. Okay, there's a reason why the Old and New Testaments are called testaments, because they express God's will, God's desire. In the Old and the New, we see a common theme which is that God wants to be in a relationship with humanity, that God is interested in redemption. And I'll just give you one for the sake of time, but in 2 Samuel chapter 7, a prophecy is given that a son of David is coming who will be the Messiah, right? A son of David. In fact, Bartimaeus will cry out, son of David, have mercy on me. And so there was always this hope in Jewish culture that one day, a son of David would come who would make things right. So could it be Solomon? Maybe Solomon's the one who will make things right. Oh, no, it's not. Okay, well, maybe it's going to be Rehoboam. Could it be Rehoboam that will make things right? Could it be Abijah? Could he be the one that will take care of us, that will look out for us, that will defend the oppressed, and that will make things right? This is why Matthew... We'll take 17 verses in uh, Matthew chapter 1 to, to connect the dots for you to show Jesus, he's got the credentials. He's a son of David. This is the one we've been waiting for. This is the one we've been looking for. This is why sometimes those seemingly insignificant genealogies, they're actually pretty important. So Matthew's trying to show his readers, hey, guys, look, this is the one we've been waiting for. So the testimony of the testaments is that Jesus is the one. He's the son of David. He is God. You know, I, I think of this thing as kind of like a decoder ring. When I was a kid, I remember I got a decoder ring and Cracker Jacks. Remember when Cracker Jacks used to be about good toys? Right? Um, you know, I got like a glow-in-the-dark yo-yo once, you know. Uh, now it's always like these like little baseball cards the size of a stamp, pretty much. But it's like a decoder ring. So as you begin to do this decoder ring, you begin to see some things that... It's all adding up. It's all pointing towards Jesus is the Christ. And so shouldn't we also consider what does Jesus himself have to say about himself? I think that would be kind of important, right? I mean, if you could get Jesus on Anderson Cooper, if you could get Jesus on Glenn Beck or some other show, what would Jesus actually have to say about Jesus? Well, I'll just give you a few here. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection to life. I am the true vine. In Matthew chapter 26, the high priest says to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, 
it is as you say. So Jesus is claiming to be God. Now, our postmodern culture, or if you take, a, if your kids take a class at um, any state university in religion, they're going to say, oh, Jesus never even claimed to be God. But you can see from the testimony here of Jesus' own words, he's saying, yeah, actually, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life, is what he says. Uh, so what about the eyewitnesses? What do they have to say about Jesus? The people who are actually there, the people who actually follow Jesus. I'll give you one example. Here's some truth for you. It's just... Uh, just in the gospel of Mark alone. In Mark chapter 4, verse 41, we see that Jesus has power over weather. He's able to calm the storms. In chapter 5, verses 1 through 20, he casts out a legion of demons. Remember, you guys, what's your name? They, they say legion. In Mark 5, 21 through 34, he heals the woman who had been hemorrhaging, we're told, for over 12 years. I mean, she'd probably been to every doctor, tried every vitamin, every home remedy, but Jesus heals her. He raises Jairus' daughter from the dead in chapter 5. So here's what's happening with all this. Is simply put, it's showing, the, the, the author here, Mark, is showing, look, Jesus has authority over weather. He's got authority over spiritual forces of darkness. He's got authority over sickness. He's even got authority over death itself. The testimony of the eyewitnesses, Jesus, this is what he did. And this is what it means. It means that he indeed is the Christ. He is the one. So let me give you some final truth here. And uh, I want to encourage you to uh, send in some text questions. But here's the final truth for you to really kind of own tonight when you walk out of here. The next time you encounter someone who you know, says, I always lead to God, truth is relative. Well, Jesus is saying he's the truth. But if you just took philosophy, you don't even have to use the Bible. If you just took philosophy, it's going to show you that there are some problems with this view that all truths are truth. Okay, there's a problem with that. Okay, first of all, you'll hear some people say there's no such thing even as absolute truth. The problem with that is the worldview has already shot itself in the foot and hasn't even gotten out the door yet. Because if there's no such thing as absolute truth, then there would be at least one but there is no truth, right? I know it sounds like a pun on, play on words, but th that's the reality of it. So let me just give you a few things here. Now, you, you've all heard a joke before, right? I know that Jews, they, uh, our Jewish friends, they don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, right? Protestants don't recognize the Pope as the leader of all Christians, right? Evangelicals do not recognize each other in Las Vegas. Right, and so, yeah, we know that our Jewish friends do not eat pork, right? Um, Hindus do not eat beef. Christians eat anything, right? I mean, have you ever been to a sweet tomatoes on a Sunday? Right after church, it's like a madhouse, right? People act like they've never seen food before, right? So, obviously, there's there's some key differences here, but is it any bigger than that? Is it any bigger than just like a joke and some dietary restrictions? Well, yeah, actually it is. Let me give you some truth. Islam teaches that there are five things you must do to enter paradise. It's a works-based religion. There's five things you must do to enter paradise. Upon entrance into paradise, certain males receive 70 virgins. Seriously, it sounds like spring break, Rocky Point, right? All right, Hinduism believes that everything is God. The chairs you're sitting in right now, it's God. This is truth. This is what Hindus believe. Everything is God. Some Hindu scholars estimate it takes about 600,000 lifetimes to achieve nirvana. This is a oneness with the universe. Now, I'm going to read to you from one of their texts. This is Garuda Purana, chapter 5. It's talking about reincarnation. The murderer of a Brahmin becomes consumptive. The killer of a cow becomes humpbacked and imbecile. The murderer of a virgin becomes leprous. All three born as outcasts. The one who steals becomes a rat. The one who steals grain becomes a locust. The one who steals perfumes becomes a muskrat. And the one who commits an unnatural vice, a village pig, right? So unlike uh, 
Arnold Ziffel, you know, good pig, and you become a, just a village pig. You know, at least Arnold could fly planes and party. All right, so what about Buddhism? Well, Buddhism teaches that there are four noble truths in the eightfold path. Well, let me give you an example of some of the things that you can become in the future. So they do believe in reincarnation, but a little different from uh, Hinduism. So there's six, there's these six different realms which you can be born into. One, you could become back as a hell being. You could come back as a hungry ghost. You could come back as an animal. You could come back as a human being, a jealous God, or you could come back as a heavenly being. Now, all of this is politically incorrect in today's culture, right? That's truth, right? So the truth is, is that all these different groups are teaching some very different things. And in this, Jesus comes onto the scene, and Jesus says, oh, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father but through me. Now, because he's God, Jesus alone has the credentials to offer forgiveness and everlasting life, okay? There's been some fantastic humanitarians, some fantastic leaders who've done, made the world a better place, and thank God for them. But they lack the credentials to extend forgiveness and grace and everlasting life. But Jesus, because he's God, because he's the Holy One, because he's without sin, because he can defeat death, because he is the great I am, he's got the credentials. Okay, and he, he'll even show this in the Gospels on a number of occasions when he'll just simply say, go and sin no more. Your, your sins are forgiven because he's got the credentials to do so. All right, so that is the truth about Jesus. That is the truth. This is why more books have been written about Jesus than anyone else, more, more than any other historical figure. It's, it's so lopsided. It's about 40 to 1. All right, so... This is the message of Jesus, and here's the good news, is that there's a way. You know, I've had people over here saying, well, Bobby, aren't you embarrassed that there's only one way? I'm thankful there's a way, all right? And I'm thankful that way is by grace. I am thankful that the way it, it, it can't be earned, it can't be worked for, because if it's dependent upon me, if it's dependent upon you and your righteousness, we're in trouble, aren't we? So thank God there's a way. And this is why the old hymn, you know, we don't sing hymns that much anymore. This is why the old hymn, Amazing Grace, is so well named. Grace, unmerited favor. And it really is amazing, isn't it? All right, well, hey, we're going to take a few of your questions, so uh, feel free to text them on in. I know I've got a few uh, already. And what is a hungry ghost? A, um, thank you. A hungry ghost is, uh, that's a term in Buddhism where, um, you have a, a neck like the size of a quarter, and you've got this huge stomach like a orca. And so you, all through whatever, that next life, you're forever unsatisfied because you've got this big, huge stomach, but you can't get the food down because you've got a throat the size of a quarter. So you're a hungry ghost. Off the topic, because that yeah. wasn't. Right. Um, <laughs> But what advice do you give in regards to potential roommates? Uh, I would encourage you a couple things. One is uh, do a, get references, okay, would be one. Um, unfortunately, sometimes with a roommate, the idea is that we're going to be like best friends. You know, we're going to be doing um, daily bread devotions in the morning over Cocoa Puffs. Um, we're going to double date. We're, you know, all this. And often the person's just looking for some lodging. All right, hey, I just want a place to lay my head. It's awesome that you're a Christian. You know, I don't have to worry about you having, you know, uh, pothead parties and crystal meth lab and the closet. But, uh, yeah, there's often people go into it with this expectation that, hey, we're going to be best buds, hanging out all the time, and maybe not, all right? And so I would just clarify, hey, what are your expectations here, especially if it's someone that you know that's also a follower of Jesus? It can be a, a great blessing as well. I'm just saying just... Clarify some things before you sign on the dotted line. And uh, make sure they pay their bills, right? So be able to, is this free housing or is this rent? Uh, it's rent, okay. All right, let me clarify some things. Oh, I thought because you were a brother in Christ, I got to stay for free. Uh, no, uh, need, need, need my money. Scenarios? Yeah, so there's just some things that you want to clarify. Unfortunately, that's just the culture. 
day and age that we live in that can save you some resentment and uh, some money. So. I have one right here. Um, how old was Jesus when he knew he was the Son of God? I think very early, you know, who knows? Uh, that's not really clarified in Scripture. You know, obviously we see him uh, at the age of 12. As the last. We don't have anything from his teenage years or his 20s, but at the age of 12, you know, we're told that he's in the temple and he's teaching with great authority. And so I would say very early. Uh, the incarnation, that's a part of uh, essential Christian doctrine. Okay, so that means it, the math doesn't add up. Okay, it's 100% man, 100% God. And it wasn't dependent upon what side of the bed. Oh, I think I'll be human today on um, God, you know, and it, it wasn't like, you know, a spiritually bipolar. So it was like a, it's what we call a uni personality, okay? And so um, I would say very early, just like a, a child, you know, at some point, you know, once they became cognizant and so forth at a very early age. I've often wondered, in fact, uh, what it must have been like uh, for some of the other kids to come over if he still had some of the presence from the wise men, you know, like... Oh, yeah, man, check it out, man. This is my G.I. Joe, and hey, this is my skateboard. It's like, yeah, what's that? Oh, that's some gold that some wise men gave me. Oh, wow. You know, it's like, well, I got some Hot Wheels, but yeah, I got some, I got some frankincense, and some myrrh. You know, so I've often, I'd like to see the video on that one day. I always wondered what it would be like to be Jesus' sibling, and he would never get in trouble. No, never. Ever. No, right. The gospel. Mom's playing favorites. You know, <laughs> oh, yeah, he is perfect. So. Now, here's one I've wondered. Okay, I'm sorry. One I've wondered was if he ever got had an upset stomach, did he heal himself? You know, like in Jesus. Well, my name. You know, be healed. But. I have a question. All right. Okay. The Gospels are um, part of the New Testament. Have been found to be dated roughly 50 years after Christ's death. What happened during those 50 years, um, and then Paul's writings are dated earlier, can you give some speculation on this? Yeah, uh, the speculation is, is that Paul was writing um, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Again, you know, uh, sometimes I hear people say, oh man, we just need to get back like the first century church. Well, hold on just a second. H have you ever read some of Paul's writings? These churches were a mess, right? Most of them. I mean, I think Philippians is like one of the few that doesn't receive like a rebuke, right? So... Paul begins to write, and says, oh, no, look, you got to, we can't be having incest in the church. People can't be showing up drunk for communion. I mean, he begins to write a lot of corrective letters. And so the church begins to blow up shortly after Pentecost, right? I mean, it goes straight from 120 into, into the thousands, right? And it just begins to spread all throughout the Mediterranean world. So Paul becomes this apostle. He begins to lead and begins to write. We were pretty confident that the Gospels began to be written, like Mark has always been presumed to be the first to be written. And we think it was written, watch this, because Mark was saying, look, man, we got to get this stuff written down, all right, because you're up for trial, all right, so we're going to lose you. we got to get this written down. So that's why it's always been thought and believed that the Gospel of Mark shows up first. We know that Luke, uh, apparently he was financed by someone, this Theophilus, more than likely financed him. He's, he does all this great research. He's the doctor. He'll give you details that are almost out of the blue, but to someone else, it's like, wow, that's really some insightful information that matches up historically. So the Gospels were written as like gospel tracts, actually. And so this is, for example, why we don't have a lot of, you know, people want to know, well, why about, what about Jesus during his uh, teens and his 20s? Well, these were written as, hey, look, man, this guy, this is the one. You got to read this. Okay, that's how the Gospels were um, the, the primary focus for them. How did uh, Catholicism grow out of Christianity? Yeah, that would come out, um, obviously, Constantine. Uh, to this, I would love to know what really went down here, all right, but we probably won't know until heaven. Constantine was in battle. He says that he saw a cross in the sky and was told, by this sign you will conquer. He begins to put crosses on the shields of the Roman shoulders, soldiers' shields across, and he wins. He says, oh, this, this works. All right? We're, everyone's becoming a Christian. This works. God saved my butt in this battle, and so my allegiance is now to him. So it becomes years later where before that, every meeting would have been like this. It was in a house church. All right? Um, they, there were no, like, really special buildings for Christians to meet. So you, you were looking for, hey, who's got the biggest living room? Who's got the biggest patio? This is what Christianity was like 
up until the 300s. So it was somewhere after that point, we can't really put our finger on it. Uh, we know that by like the 600s, things were a little out of sync with uh, the New Testament as far as Christianity goes. Is it appropriate for married or engaged people to spend time alone with people of the opposite sex, including lunch or, or uh, including lunch with coworkers? Um, you know, that's, that's a really tough scenario. Um, it, you know, take something like lunch, I, th I think it would depend on the nature of it. I mean, if you were taking them out to Ocean's Club, then that's saying something, that's sending a message. All right, if you're going out to Wendy's and you're talking shop, you're talking business, I mean, the reality of air culture is that women have been in the workplace since the 1970s, right? A lot of people don't even think twice about it really anymore, right? And so it just depends on the nature of it. You know, if you're married, like there's times in my environment where I have to meet with a female. Uh, air policy, I can just tell you here, like at uh, City of Grace is we let one of the pastors know, hey, this is who I'm meeting with, this is where I'm meeting them when and this is the topics that I need to meet with them about, okay? Um, myself, because I'm married, I often will let my spouse know as well, okay? It's been a few times, I've been married for 17 years, it's been a few times, I can think of only like three, so on one hand, I can count the times where my wife said, I really would rather you not meet with her alone, all right? I was like, what? But she has the gift of women's intuition, all right? And so, uh, and I just trust her judgment on those things, so um, it's not crystal clear. You know, so the Bible tells us to abstain from the appearance of evil. So it would depend, I think, on the nature and the venue and so forth and what you're participating in. So we've got some Christian liberty here, but you wouldn't want to abuse it. Okay. Do we know where Joseph, Jesus' earth father, was during the crucifixion? There isn't much record of, is there much record of his reaction to Jesus? There's not. There's a, again, this is deductive theological reasoning, but it appears that Joseph's fa uh, Joseph passed away pretty early. Okay, so the last time he's seen as well is when Jesus is 12. And so when we see Jesus, he's a carpenter. Okay, and he seems to be the leader as well, obviously, at his house. But we do see Mary and his brothers are referenced all the time. Right? And so the tradition has always been, just through deductive reasoning, we don't know for a fact, but it's always been thought that Joseph passed away before the public ministry of Jesus began. If both are Christians, can opposite genders be roommates? One more time. If both are Christians, can opposite genders be roommates? Oh, uh, pff, no, wouldn't recommend it. Uh, it can happen. Uh, I would want to say make sure if there's even the slightest inkling of a romantic interest, I mean, you're, you're asking for trouble, all right? And so... Uh, I would say the wiser choice would be no on that one, okay? And again, it would depend on what kind of a role and influence you have within the church and the community as well, okay? Here's what the, the world presumes. You're sleeping together. That's what the world's going to presume. So for me, it's like, nah, that's, I don't want people even thinking that, you know, if it, if it were me, and that's what I would advise you as well. Okay? Can you do it and be pure? Sure, of course. But again, is it the wisest course of action? Is the wisest testimony? I would say probably not. What do you think of people seeing the image of Jesus in different things like toast, soapy windows? Uh, does God really reveal himself like that? Yeah, no, tacos and um, sweet potatoes. Um, I don't know. Um, when I was writing out, well, okay, I've already cat out of the bag. I wrote a book on UFOs um, about six, seven years ago. When I was doing it, it was fascinating. What I noticed is that a lot of the Marian apparitions, okay, a Marian apparition is like an appearance of Mary, okay, that whatever they saw her in the sky, they saw her shadow, or she was in a, I don't know, beef jerky, something. Um, <laughs> what I noticed is there was a lot of similarities. And my concern was that if it really was Mary, she would say, worship my son. But I never came across that. It was like, hey, I want you to build me a basilica here. Like, hmm, but, you know, I don't know about that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm not, I don't deny people aren't seeing things. Um, if can God somehow use a shadow or um, a grasshopper egg that looks like the Madonna? And G yeah. yeah, sure, he can do anything. And so if somehow that can be used, sure. You know, it, it's quite possible. I wouldn't put it past God, put it that way, all right? Uh, I'd just like to 
I kind of have like my own matrix. That's the, that's the funnel point. When, when you come through this funnel, is it pointing people to Jesus? And okay, uh, I'm good with that. All right, but my concern is if it's pointing something else to seek another supernatural sign, what happens in our culture? And it's, it's going to happen more and more. Just read Revelation. It's going to happen. People end up chasing the signs rather than Jesus. All right? Hey, in some degree, it happens here in evangelical Christianity. People will chase the feeling. Oh, I got to have that feeling again. And now you're chasing an emotional experience. You're not chasing the Holy Spirit anymore. All right, so that would be my only concern. So I don't deny it that it could happen. All right, and we know that Muslims, when they fast during Ramadan, there's been more than one testimony. Uh, you know, Brian was with me in Turkey, and um, Rhonda. You know, we heard about this, but um, they fast for a vision, and guess who starts showing up? Jesus shows up. All right, so. It could happen. So I would just say, hey, let's put a matrix and see who it's pointing to ultimately. So I have one more question. Okay. Um, what does the term postmodernism mean? Okay. Uh, well, fortunately, I've written a book. So <laughs> tell my wife that texted in, we need to go on it's vacation possible. this summer. Okay. Uh, postmodernism, um, it's a term of loosely connected philosophies to describe two things a philosophy that we're in. And also an age, like you've heard the age of enlightenment, okay? We're in postmodern age, so I give it four ingredients, and it's a really easy acronym. It's R-I-P-S, so just think of RIPS. R is relativism. Truth is relative. That was the video clip we saw. Hey, what's true for you may not be true for me. That was in your, your handout. Pilate asked that question, basically, all right? What is truth? And earlier, John 14, Jesus says, I am truth, all right? So it's, hey, what's true for you may not be true for me. Oh, I'm so glad Christianity works for you. Buddhism works for me. You ever heard that before? Oh, I'm so glad that Jesus thing is working out for you. Uh, it doesn't work for me. Okay, so it's truth is relative. Uh, the I would be an ignorance of Christian beliefs. So we live in a generation now that they didn't make it to Sunday school. Right? They didn't go to vacation Bible school. Right? They think that Awana is a country in Africa. Right? Never what? Awana. Um, never heard of it. KJV, what? I mean, our terminology sounds like a cult to them, right? Anointed, uh, somebody sprays us, we use a hedge of protection. What? What are you talking about? Okay, so um, seriously, I mean, so they have no knowledge. They didn't have Christian parents, more than likely. Uh, the P is really some of the things we talked about tonight is pluralism. They believe that all ways lead to God. Just pick one. Just pick one out. They all lead to the same place. Well, as we saw tonight, the truth is, no, they don't. Got a paradise and some virgins and hungry ghosts and all right so and then the s is going to be spiritual curiosity so i don't know this will probably be the one to, to go the, the quickest and it's already happening in the united kingdom and in um, western europe Plus right now in america spiritual curiosity uh, there's a hunger there's a thirst for the supernatural right have you ever noticed how many television shows uh, are focused on the supernatural um, my wife and I, we like to watch Travel Channel, but now it's seriously, it's like uh, most haunted places. Um, these guys who are always chasing stuff, you know, they hear a furnace cut on, oh, I'm going to that. You know, and it's like, it could just be a furnace cutting on, right? But to them, it's something supernatural <laughs> happened, right? I mean, air, I mean, seriously, they're so hungry, so thirsty for it's like anything, okay? So it's uh, this hunger and thirst for the supernatural. So for the most part, I've noticed the Holy Spirit hasn't been invited to the party in this one. All right. So those are just some elements that describe our culture that we live in. So, all right, those are good questions. So I hope that you guys uh, feel equipped, and I hope that you walk out here a little smarter, that as followers of Jesus, hey, we didn't check our brains at the door, okay, when we became followers of Christ. Uh, there's historical evidence, there's the eyewitness evidence, and there's the words of Jesus himself, which I think is really important. You know, if you're going to study someone, shouldn't it be important that we take a look at what he had to say about himself? And so he makes it pretty crystal clear that I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So here's what I need you to do. Two things. One, next time you're at that party, next time you're at that wedding, next time you're wherever you're at and the topic comes up about Jesus, I want you to step up to the bat, all right? Step up to the plate, rather. Swing your bat kindly, all right? Step up. Represent. Right, show people that, you know, there's actually some historical information. 
And here's the final piece of evidence I can give you. It's you. You're the exhibit A. You don't have to know about the ark and carbon-14 dating and were dinosaurs on the ark, were they babies, were... All right, hell, hell, I don't know. It'd be like the blind man, John chapter 9. Oh, no, I was blind, now I see. All right, what about carbon-14 dating? Oh, man, I don't, I don't know, man. No one thing. Jesus changed my life. All right, so you've got your own exhibit A. Let me tell you what Bobby was like B.C., before Christ. I want to tell you how I came to be a follower. Let me tell you what my life has been like since. So you're the exhibit A. You can always, you've always got your story. And no one can debate the fact that you're a changed life. All right? All right. Well, um, what we'd like for you to do is um, just take some prayer requests at the table you're at. Or are we doing it slightly different or the same way? We still do that. Okay, so you do have those cards, and so uh, Nini's helped us create a system where we can pray for you throughout the week. We've got some prayer warriors here, so if there's something going on in your life, um, somehow get those cards to Nini. I'm not sure to process if they're not a country, but uh, <laughs> if you can fill those cards out, we will pray for you during the week, but I'd like for you to just take a few moments at the table you're at. Just take some prayer requests, what's going on in your life, how you can pray for each other, and uh, we'll call it a night. Thanks for being here. Next week, I'm going to talk about the Bible. Uh, how we, what evidence do we have that the Bible is a unique book as compared to all other forms of sacred writings? All right? Cool.